are you today? Hanging in there, buddy. How are you? Ah, uh, okay. You know, it's nice and uh, sunny here today. That's good. I haven't been out yet, so uh, we'll see what's happening. But I'm excited today. We've got a great, great guest. Yeah, this We're, is a this is a big show today. One of my favorite people. Uh, we know her since she's uh, what? Well, she started on the show 18 years old. Was she 18? Well, we'll I think, ask her I, she, I think she was 18, and uh, uh, she was nice enough to come on. So uh, let's say hello to Jamie Lynn Sigler, ladies and gentlemen. Meadow. Hey. In the flesh. How are you? She is. I'm good. How are you? Good. You look terrific. Everything's good? Oh. Yeah. You know, all things considered, everyone I know and love is healthy, and that's really all that matters right now. So we're all good. That's fantastic. And you're out in California. I am. I've been here, right? I've moved here right when we stopped filming Sopranos. So I've been here 11 and a half years. Oh, you've been there that long? I didn't know. Yep. You know, I don't know why I didn't know that. Yeah. Because I, I know you had a place in Tribeca at one point, right? Yes. Which I regret every day that I got rid of. Yeah, yeah. Probably worth a lot more now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah. So let me ask you, Jamie. So when, when you started on the show, I mean, what? So let's go from the beginning, if you don't. Yeah. Uh, cause I'm curious as is Michael, what, how'd you get the gig? I mean, were you working before? How old were you? Tell me. What I was, you? I was 16 years old. Um, I had strictly only ever done musical theater. Um, I never, I maybe auditioned a couple of times here and there. I had a very small agent, a very small manager. I used to get most of my auditions from backstage because it was just for kind of Broadway and touring type stuff. Um, but I remember it was the summer I was 16 and I was going to go to sleepaway camp that summer because there wasn't really a lot of like musical theater roles for teenagers. Uh -huh. So I decided I was going to try to be like all my friends. And right before I left, I got a call about a 16 year old Italian looking girl for a show called Sopranos. It was the only information I got. And then a, the sides were Meadow arguing with Carmela about wanting to go on a ski trip with Hunter. And I figured because of the title, maybe it was musical, and I figured I could pass for Italian, um, <laughs> so I went in. And my first audition was just with Georgianne, um, who is just the warmest, loveliest person and makes everyone feel so comfortable. And it was not something I was, you know, very familiar with, fighting with my mother about wanting to do things that she wasn't going to let me do. And then I got home, and this was the time with no cell phone, so I had a message on my answering machine from my manager saying they want you to come back tomorrow. So I went back the next day, and David was in the room. Um, I read the same thing, and then I remember I asked, do you need me to sing? <laughs> I remember him saying, That's why? Funny. That's and I was funny. like, oh, never mind. <laughs> he said, why? Yeah, why? He wasn't going to let you off the hook. And no, eventually you did not. sing anyway, right? He did. They, they wrote yeah, it in the yeah, show, yeah. I guess, for me. Maybe. Who knows? Um, and then I had another callback two days later with producers. And then at that point, I think Eileen Landris was in there, a couple of the other producers. And that's when there was a bunch of Meadows and AJs. Um, you, had a, you had a read three times. And then a screen test. Wow. So then the fourth time was a screen test. It was down to two girls. I remember them saying that they had um, apprehension of how tan I was. So for the week before my audition, I like stayed out of the sun. I wore long sleeves, I remember, in the dead of August to those H the HBO building in the city. And it was very intimidating because, again, I had really never auditioned for a TV or film before. And this was all very scary and new. And you're 16. And I'm 16. You're a kid? Um, and it was now the scene of, again, the same scene of fighting with Carmela. And then the other one was where she talks to Tony about his ancestors building the church, um, that's in the pilot. And Johnny V read Tony Soprano with me. Really? Oh, that mm -hmm. John Ventimiglia played Artie Bucco. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, uh, so did they, when you did the screen test, did they fly you to LA? No, it was in New York well, at the HBO in building New York. in New York. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Because Michael, you went to LA, right? My test was in L.A. So was uh, Jim and Edie and Lorraine. We were all. Now, in, well, did uh, you did you meet Robert Isla? Did you meet him then? I didn't. I didn't meet him till the read through. Really? Yeah. I mean, so that's pretty amazing. So this was nineteen ninety seven. Yes. Wow! Wow! So yeah. 
Uh, it must have been nerve wracking. Well, you were living in Long Island, right? With your family? Living on Long Island with my family. I was a sophomore going into my junior year of high school. Um, and I remember showing up to the table read. And, you know, there's kind of a blessing when you're that young. Like, you're nervous, but you fake it till you make it. You know, you're just, you don't want to show that you don't know what you're doing. At least that was my personality. Um, and fortunately, also for me, you guys were all so warm and, and giving. But I remember just sitting at that table and looking at this, you know, the caliber of actors and how great every was, one was and thinking, wow, this is something, this is something big in my life right now. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That is amazing. You know, we, uh, when we spoke to Robert, you know, he said in some ways Jim became like a father figure, but did you feel any of that from Jim or Edie that, that there was like that parental kind of vibe that, that eventually blossomed between you guys? I, I think especially with Jim, you know, I was I was somebody that was difficult to get close to and that was my fault. I think I was holding on to a lot of things for a long time and Jim was someone who saw through that and in his own particular nice special way, he would always kind of like pry and ask and he became somebody that I eventually did open up to about a lot of things privately. And so yes, for him, he definitely felt like another father figure in a way of just somebody that I knew I could count on and who would be there, but was never like, you know, aggressive about it or pushy. It was just kind of like, I got you if you need me. Like there was a time in the maybe fifth, fourth or fifth season where I was dealing with a divorce privately and my diagnosis of MS and a lot of stuff that I wasn't talking to people about. And he sent his acting coach, Susan, to work with me just to make sure that I was taken care of in that side because he knew I was going through a lot of stuff. So like little things like that, that he really, you know, just stepped up in amazing ways. Well, he really cared. That was the thing. I mean, you know, yeah. well, he wasn't faking it. I mean, no, he really gave a shit, you know, now, totally. Uh, the, now I read something or I heard you say it that in the, the fifth episode college, right. Which, uh, you know, we talked about already, the fifth episode, you had a lot of big scenes with Jim. It was basically you and him the entire mm -hmm. episode. And you were kind of nervous and a little uncomfortable. And Jim said, just look me in the eyes and talk to me. Yeah. Well, tell me about that. I mean, so what scene was that where he said that? It, that was um, in the dinner scene where the two of us went out to dinner and I'm asking him and he's basically opening up about like maybe he didn't have a choice into what he was doing with his life. and. Um, I remember he just, he could feel that I was, you know, wanting so badly to do a good job. And he said, Jamie, just look in my eyes and trust me. Just like, just talk to me. Yeah. And it was just, he just gave me such great lessons during that whole episode of being an actress. I remember when we shot the scene in the car about asking if he was in the mafia. Um, after I finished my cover coverage, Alan Alan Coulter was like, Jamie, are you good? So let's wrap it up. We can move on. And Jim said, wait. And he looked at me and said, do you feel good? Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? He said, do you feel like you have more to give or you want to do something different? And I didn't know I could ask for that. And so he just, he gave me a lot of gifts during that time. And it was a special bonding time, just being the two of us and really made me feel, you know, confident with that. I had a place in the show, you know? He did that all the time, you know, like he always asked actors if they wanted to, he made sure actors got another take if they did. He wanted everybody to feel comfortable, both both the crew and the cast, you know what I oh, mean? Oh yeah, he, oh yeah, you're right. I mean, what he, really, he really cared, you know, I mean, like I said, uh, uh, he wasn't faking that, that wasn't a, that wasn't a show. He gave a shit if you were happy. He did it to me all the time also. Yeah. What would you say is uh some one of your fondest memories of the whole experience hmm, that's a good question and that's a tough question because it's a big one but if you yeah. if anything jumps out at you um well i particularly loved when we would have scenes with everybody um yeah, and i too. would get to work with you guys and like you know when whether it was a funeral scene or a you know dinner scene like i just i really loved getting to to work with other people and you guys, because we would see each other at events and the table reads, but like to get to connect and work with each other was really special to uh, me always. Um, but I think it was like the quiet scenes, especially with Jim and Edie, because I looked up to them so much as actors and they gave me so much. Um, 
that when we would have those quieter scenes, um, they always just gave me such encouragement. Um, even, I mean, after they would air, Edie would always call me after a particular episode if she liked what I did just to tell me like how proud she was of me. Those types of things just meant a lot because, you know, I, I was working with you guys, like the best of the best still in my opinion. And so I, to feel like worthy of, of being playing opposite you guys was, it meant a lot to me. You know, uh, you know, that's the one thing people don't realize, you know, even though we're all on the show together, you know, you don't see everybody because you work right. with, like you worked with Jim and Edie a lot and Robert and, you know, everyone thinks that you all see each other all the time and you're working together, but you don't, sometimes I didn't see Michael for, uh, you know, a month or whoever, because you, yeah. you know, you see them at the read through, you see them at events, but I don't think me and you ever had a scene together, just the two of us. No. You know, no. so you have those big scenes where, you know, it's kind of, uh, like Michael's described it before, it's kind of like, you know, you're hanging out with your friends. It's kind of a little bit of a party. The yeah. funeral scenes, the wedding scenes, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, but you know what? The most powerful scene I ever did, and it was also with John Patterson, rest in peace, who I loved so much, I know we all did, was yeah. when I face off with Jim and I call him Mr. Mob Boss. It was like a, a magnetic feel that I'd never felt before as an actress of just like, like we're doing something really cool. And I remember um, James coming into my ear and saying like, you hate this man, you're furious at this man. And just, it, it was just a really powerful moment that like those moments you strive for as an actor where they feel really real and you're kind of like shaking afterwards. That was one of my favorite scenes I ever got to do. And now as a singer, uh, I saw you on Broadway, which you were terrific. Uh, and you sang a lot. Yeah, you, you've had, you know, right? You had CDs out. You've were working on singing now. Uh, acting, singing. Uh, well, let me just say that, like, putting the CD out was like a situation where, like, I got roped in and was young and vulnerable. Didn't have the right. That's not for me. Like, I'm not that type of singer. I'm more a theater, Broadway type singer. Uh, that's how I prefer to do it. I mean, but if I had to choose, I don't know. I feel like I do my best acting when I'm singing because when you have music, it builds the beats and the moments for you and you kind of follow along. Um, but I also try to bring like rhythm and stuff into my acting because I think they're very intertwined. But if I had to choose, I guess it would be acting. Now you told me earlier this morning that you are only watching the show for the first time right now. Yeah. Outside of like the premieres when we were all there and screenings right. and, and events, but you just watched the first season of The Sopranos for the first time like the last couple of like, weeks. Yes, yes. Wow. Really? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think as like a young girl, like self-conscious, I just didn't want to watch myself. And I'm, so, but I'm also really grateful that I have waited till now because I wouldn't have gotten it as a 17, 18, 19, 20 year old girl. Like I wouldn't have really understood and I'm able to watch it now with so many years past. Like what, as an audience, I'm watching all of you guys and I'm just sitting there and it's, I looked at my husband the other day and it's not that I've ever, you know, gotten annoyed. Like it's that the fact that Sopranos leads every conversation with me always, especially when it comes to acting. But now I'm sitting here watching being like, holy shit. I got to be a part of this. This is, this is so cool. I'm just, I'm so proud, prouder than I've ever been genuinely. And I just love it. I love the show and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm so glad that this much time has passed and I'm watching it now as, you know, a 38 year old woman and, and really appreciating. I am the age now that Edie was playing Carmela. Wow. You know? wow. Well, that's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> that's wow. so bizarre. You, you know, uh, I, I, I hear you, uh, what you're saying, you know, I, I hate to watch myself. Michael, I don't think, likes to watch himself. There's a few actors on the show that probably watch themselves on a loop all day long. <laughs> I, won't me I won't mention any names. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, Norman Desmond. Let, let, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you a question. Uh, when the show was on, and you were young, you're 21. Now, you know, the show's in full gear. You're 21, you're 22. You're at all these events. I mean, 
all the publicity. I mean, you were out there. Did you enjoy that? I don't know if I could say if I liked it or didn't like it. I, I mean, I can look back. I hate to say I have regrets because I think everything like leads you to who you are today and I'm proud of who I am today. But I wish I had a little more guidance, better guidance during that time. I think I was just... I was naive and I, I was taking whatever came at me and, and, yeah. you know, I, I, to a degree. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was such a, and I think being in New York, other than when we went to the Emmys or any of the award shows, I didn't really have like a grasp on like how big it was because I felt like I still was li living a very normal life. Um, but nowadays like events and things like that are work to me. You know, oh, yeah, that's yeah. not like, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not jumping at, at the bit to go to anything. <laughs> like I You know, I, I just started watching the show for the first time since it initially aired back in the day, you know, oh, wow. and, uh, and it's been interesting uh, looking back at the character. And I, my, my question for you is kind of twofold. Looking back, A, how do you, how do you feel about Meadow and who she was as a person? And B, do you see similarities between Jamie and Meadow? or the differences as well. I see the similarities I see is that, you know, I very much was like that young girl that like wanted to have the adult conversations and wanted to act like I knew everything because I just so badly wanted the respect and like to tell me like it is still to this day. Like I don't like um, anyone to give me like a, like a pussyfoot answer. Like I want the real, I can handle it. And so I think I'm very similar to Meadow in that way. Um, but I was a, I was a 16, 17 year old girl at that time. So like I, 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 I am proud of the work that I did, but it was, I was really familiar with that stage of life. And I think that, um, especially watching the pilot, I, d I thought my part was so small, but when I watched it now recently, I was like, wow, I had a, I had a significant role in this and it's 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 um cool to see and i i think that she the way she affected her parents um was pretty significant and i can see it now being a mother i mean I, my my on my kids you know my best day is when is my kid's best day and his worst day is my worst day so i understand that and so you know the dilemma that she caused with both of them as their child and and who she was um I understand more now, but it was probably better that I didn't understand it then and was just really living like a true teenager. Yeah, but I, I, I listen, I, I met you in 99 or 2000. Uh, you seem like, you know, you were always very sweet. I mean, I'm not just saying that. You always couldn't be nicer, more polite, come from a nice yes. family. It was... Jamie doing bad things like Meta? No, no. Meta, I, I think not. I got to like exercise a lot of my attitude through her. So I was really nice everywhere else. No. Yes, you're always very we, nice. Personality wise, we were very different. Um, our approach to things and the way we spoke to people was very different, of course. But um, just like I said, it's just an understanding of where she was coming from, I had. But yeah, no. I, yeah, I, but I also had to look up a lot of the words that she said. She was a. Uh, much more of an intellect. But, but Meadow Met was yeah, very smart and very tough early on. Uh, when you go, you know, there's the, the episode where you go to buy the meth from Christopher. I mean, you're right at it. You're, you're, you're a smart aleck. You're battling with him. You're not let, giving him an inch. I mean, yes. and you see that throughout the series. You know, when you go to law school and et cetera, et cetera, you go head to head with your dad. Uh, I mean, you were great. Thanks. Just, just great, honestly. I remember I loved filming that whole, the meth stuff with with Michael and Drea. Yeah. That, that, again, like those were the moments where I was like, I never get to work with them. And to have all those scenes with you guys was really, was really special to me. Yeah, we did that episode recently. And we, we were talking about how almost, in some ways, Meta was almost like a mob chick in training and for way, sure you know, she didn't give up christopher she could have easily and just lost it and said i got it from christopher you know whatever and she decided to just no that's not cool that's not gonna that's really messed up and dangerous and uh it's admirable yeah move, well, i think on her part she had a few moments like that you know when jackie jr died you know even though she right. was like upset 
of what happened, you know, she had that moment with her and the other girls in the kitchen, you know, telling the cousin that she was shocked that she would talk about this to an outsider. You know, she definitely had that loyalty deep rooted. How many relationships did she have? How many boyfriends? She had Patrick, Jackie Jr. I think she had three. Oh, no, four. And Finn. Finn. And then, and then the last guy. I and can't Noah? Remember. No, is Noah one Noah, of them? Noah, Noah, Jackie, Finn, and then the final guy, which I'm, I'm right. blanking on right now. I haven't gotten there yet. Who was that one? The guy I was engaged to at the end, but it was very... Uh, oh, Parisi? Wasn't yes. that the Parisi? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Patty Parisi's son, right? Yes, uh, yes. Is yes. it Patty Parisi? No. Or Philly. I'm saying yes, and I don't know. Phil, Phil Parisi. <laughs> I know of Patty Parisi in real life. No, there <laughs> were two Parisis. One yeah. was Patty, one was Phil. They were oh, brothers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jamie, when you did Broadway, now, yeah. I, I, I would be horrified, and you're out there, 1,500, 2,000 people, eight times a week, how was that? I mean, what, do you miss that? Do you want to do that again? Oh, yeah. Would you love to do that? I mean, I grew up doing musical theater, literally up until The Sopranos started. I'd never been on a film set. I thought my stand-in, the first day of work on the pilot, they were like, still deciding who was going to be Meadow. Like, I was so confused. Like, <laughs> everything was brand new to me. So Broadway and being on stage. Good. It's probably good you were that naive. Totally. Don't I'm worry Robert, about anything. Robert was the one that was telling me, you know, like, this is what check the gate means. He was the old pro. He had been on a bunch of film sets before. So he was the one that's schooling me. Uh, but theater, I, I mean, that's like home to me. That's like, I don't even think about how many people are out there. That's my favorite, favorite thing to do. I mean, because of, I have certain physical limitations right now. Um, I always used to put it off, but then seeing people like Ali Stroker doing, you know, being a lead in a wheelchair, things like yeah. that. I mean, it's still a dream I don't want to give up on. And, um, I work hard on my health and my fitness every day. So I'm hoping that it's in the cards for me again. But I mean, sure. you don't, but that doesn't bother you going out there. No, it comes natural. It's not like, Oh my God, what am I doing? No film is so much more intimate for me. That's where I get more nervous. Um, stage is like right at home. Steve, can you take over here? I certainly <laughs> can. So, uh, can you see that? That's good, that's, yeah. That's so, mild, right? So this is in the pilot. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we got a two or three inch okay. wings. Uh, Tony, like we said, only him and Grandpa Munster have that hairdo. Right. Never quite took off across the country. But in the pilot, Paulie Walnuts has two inch, two to three inch wings. And in episode eight. Oh, my. We're talking about. Whoa. Look at that. That's a full-blown eight-incher, I'd say. Oh, yeah. Right? That's oh, yeah. pretty good. <laughs> eight That's inch a good way. one. I, got, I want to ask you, Jamie, if you remember, we were doing a promo shoot for the poster, and me, you, and Robert were sitting on the couch, and every, people were getting ready. Some were getting made up. Tony always did his own hair, but he was standing, like, on the other side of the room. Do you remember this? And he took, he had a can of hairspray and you, me, you and Robert were just watching and he went. <laughs> In the air, this cloud, it yes. went on for like five minutes. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. And the hairspray just fell on and he just stood there and you, we all looked at each other. And we were like, oh my oh, God. He is so funny. I forgot how funny the oh, show yeah, is yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. but he is so phenomenal yeah. oh what a character you know uh, remember i don't know if you ever have a scene with him and you're doing something you go hold on hold on hold on, hold on. and he pull out the little bottle of banaka open your mouth or, oh i thought you were gonna say the cologne no no but he would go open your mouth open your mouth <laughs> get that <laughs> take that stink off and then he would uh, slap you in the face with a uh, cologne, boom, boom, and you smell like Tony Sirico for two Always. Years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Or Banaka, but not for himself. He'd Banaka you. Yo, he yes. Banaka yes. goes over a cross. Sure. And he also had the cologne, and he also had, a, you would carry hairspray. See, but with Jamie, that day was the first time we ever saw him his doing process. his hair. Because yes. he did it at home. He didn't do it in the makeup trail. We, Correct. We would go in, but he would not go in the makeup trail for hair. He'd only go for makeup. That was the first time we saw the hair, the, the routine, and it was the ozone layer, the ozone yeah. hole 
Hello. How much bigger that day? What, was Hello. it? A, was it a, a? Does he had a brand of hairspray, or did he just use Aquanet? Oil? I was going to say, I think he's an but aqua, he, that guy. But he, he had huge, I guess they were professional grade cans. I've never oh, saw yeah. a can that big. They were, they were for like beauty parlors. They were gigantic. Oh, yeah. I'm not well, kidding. he needed it. Hey, he think ne- about he it. That was, it. That yes. was a he, week's He never work. got the endorsements. He never, he should have endorsed that, aqua. He could have. So, and. J.B. Lynn, I, I, I did your wonderful podcast, and I had a ball with you and Robert. Yes. Pajama pants. Tell yes. us a little about that. And how that well, <laughs> Look, Rob and I are best friends and have been since the show. And we have such a special relationship. And him and I have been through many stages of life during the show, since the show. And, um, you know, Rob really shines doing this podcast. I mean, he's such a good host. And I think he's found something he really enjoys doing. And we have our friend Kasim, who's hilarious. And we're all very different. We're all different walks of life, dealing with different things in life. Um, but we just felt like we have a lot to talk about. Rob and I have had, you know, normally like one to two hour conversations every time we talk about life and, um, spirituality and his meditation and his, you know, recovery and then my kids and my life. And so, you know, pajama pants is just about everything and nothing and bringing on cool friends and guests and getting to talk to them and hear about our relationships with them. And it's been a lot of fun. And he's, what was Robert? He's three years younger than you? He's four years younger than me. Four years younger than you. Yeah. So you are the big sister for real. Yeah, but in very, he's very protective of me. And he's, you know, he, he, I can guarantee that a week does never go by without him checking up on me and how I'm doing. And Aida was in town a couple of weeks ago and him and her came over and I cooked them <laughs> dinner and she's as kooky and amazing as ever. Oh, she's great. Oh, she looks great, too. She's been through a lot, you know? Yeah, she's great, though. I, I text with her. We're going to have her on probably. Good. We're still in the first season. We're going to have her on. Oh, yeah. In the second season. Uh, I look forward to talking to her. So, Michael, you haven't done pajama pants yet. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to go on. Yeah. Yes, we can't it's, wait. It's a, it's we will a lot, a lot of fun. You let, uh, just let me know when it's good, and we'll figure it out. Definitely. And uh, we want to thank you for, for joining us today. It's was wonderful oh my to have God! You. Really, thank you so much. Really, uh, it's a pleasure to see you and talk to you and give us all that insight and uh, enjoy your Bose headphones. Seven hundred. I, I will. Right. I was just going to say thank you for my headphones. All right. Thank we'll you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Good to talk right, to you. Guys. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much. Take care. Right. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much, Jamie Lynn Sigler. What a uh, a good friend and and great to have you on the show. Thanks. All right, man. Let's start. Let's start with this ep- this incredible episode eight, season one. Yeah, this uh, when I got this script, um, I remember the scene, the title, "The Legend of Tennessee Moltisanti," and I was very surprised, you know, because um, I was not sure what it was about. Right, what well, Moltisanti is in the title, and then you know when I read it, um, I was kind of blown away because at this point. You know, this is episode eight of the whole series. And I had some good stuff, but like a decent scene here. There were a few episodes I hardly did anything. And when I read this, I realized, oh, they're kind of making this guy a big character. I mean, this episode, he's really, Christopher's really heavy. It's a lot of interesting st- seeds and that they're laying for the future. I didn't necessarily know that that was going to happen, you know? So when I read this script, I was, I was really like very happy very pleasantly surprised. It was such good stuff, such meat on the bone. Um, I mean, when we came back, right, uh, after the pilot got picked up, I remember reading, you know, episode two. It was before they cast the role of Brendan. And I was so neurotic, you know, I see Brendan Falone, he's a handsome young guy, and I'm thinking, oh, they're, they're bringing this character on to replace Christopher. Of course, that's what you think, because you. That's what I thought. Every actor's a lunatic. That's why. Yeah, that's Myself how. Included. Nuts and embarrass. <laughs> it's embarrassing to say, but I really felt that. And then, you know, and then I met Anthony, who, who who I loved, and and we had a good time, and he was gone. But I, you know, you don't know in the beginning. I didn't know how big this character was going to go, but when I read this script, um, you know, it really meant something to me. Tennessee Williams, who's they're referring to in the title, and I have the same birthday. Really. So, 
And when, when, I was, when I was in high school, I started reading plays. That's really what made me want to go into acting and eventually writing and stuff. And one of them was uh, Streetcar Named Desire and then Glass Menagerie. And he was really a very big uh, influence, you know, on me. And that's I was just, just in... I that's was just, just a in coincidence. New Orleans. Yeah, that's a coincidence. But I was just in New Orleans and I saw the house where he wrote Streetcar, the actual address where the Kowalskis, the characters live, that house is actually there. He also lived in Manhattan Plaza, you know, on 42nd and, and 9th, uh, which is artists' house, you know, they're high rises but for artists, but he lived there, I think, until he died, pretty much. Yeah, that um, uh, Manhattan Plaza is a building on 42nd and 9th, and it was built with the neighborhood. No one wanted to live there. It was just horrifying. They couldn't rent it, so they opened it to artists, uh, actors, writers, and you pay what you can afford. So right. it's depending on what, how much you work or what you made that year. That and it goes on today. Larry David it's lived still there. like that. A lot, of, a lot of famous people. That lived there. I used to live uh, around the corner when I, in 1987. I worked across the street at Shea Josephine. But anyway, so when I read it, I was really, really happy. This was written by David and Frank Renzulli. Uh, and directed by Tim Van Patten. This is the first episode of many that he would direct. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, so, I, I, you know, you, you, episode eight, were they written? Was the whole season written? Or did they see, hey, Christopher was great in the pilot. Uh, you know, Michael Imperial was great in the pilot. I like what he's done so far. Let's give him this big episode. Or was it written when you came back 10 months later? Do you know that? Do you know what they I'm saying? Weren't, they were not all written before we went into production for the season. They, 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 was, they were an ongoing process. There may have been storylines that David had in mind before, you know, when they opened the writer's room before we went into production for that first season. But they, you know, those scripts were ongoing as production happened. Well, he obviously liked what you did, or they wouldn't give you this huge episode. That, you know, oh, I'm, yeah. No, no, honestly, no. Because, no, no, no. you know, they, they hire a guy, and then the guy turns out, you know, he was great in the audition, blah, blah, blah. And you know this happens on every show. And I then know. when the guy's got to get to the set and do it in front of 150 people, cast, crew, director, everything's on you, man. The cameras, it's not so easy. Some guys fall apart. And yeah. You know, obviously they like what you did. Yeah, you know. Or some guys are pain in the ass and nobody likes to work with them. <laughs> it's a problem. And it, unless you're a big star, they'll replace you, you know. And they'll, uh, and they'll uh, only put up with you as long as uh, things are good, you know. And then eventually yeah, yeah. everybody will uh, take a shit. All right, let's get into this episode. So David Chase wrote it with Frank Renzulli. Uh, it opens up with the G, uh, dream sequence. Christopher is leaning against the wall. He's in the in the pork store, and it's slow motion. Were you moving in slow motion, or did they put it in slow motion? Um, what do you remember? In the beginning, I don't remember. I think I was just being very still, you know. Um, you have the image of the, the pig on the wall. When, yeah. when Christopher killed uh, Emil Kolar, it was his first murder that he committed. There was a pig's head right next to him that he sees. So, you know, we're, he's being haunted by this murder that he did at the beginning. Um, and and uh, let me ask you about the shot. There's a shot, I mean, where you're, where are, what are you on there? Uh, I'm on like a dolly. You're on a dolly where, yeah. you know, which is a great shot. Just, just fantastic. I mean, so as soon as you see that, you know, it's a dream. You know what I mean? Yeah, and there's this thing of it's kind of like he's being blown along by the wind in the air. You know, this the there's a wind references in this episode, and I'll point them out as as we get to. Now them. you see, uh, uh, email as you call him, email. Email caller. Yeah. He, he orders a sandwich. Uh, it's a great scene. He says he's got the bullets, uh, and then of course you've got Adriana eating sausages. She's on her knees. She's and, wearing white. And you say Adriana uh, turns into Carmela. Turns into Carmela. Well, there's these images of man, you know, this kind of Freudian stuff about manhood, the sausage, the virgin, the the mother figure. It, you know, it's, it's a lot about him, I think, questioning 
his manhood or his you uh, know, his potency as a person. The song, interesting enough, is by the Aquatones. It's called You. It was in the movie Mean Streets. One of the actors from Mean Streets appears in this episode, uh, Richard Romulus. And also this song comes back in a later dream sequence in the episode, Everybody Hurts. Uh, Tony has a dream of Gloria later on, but it's the same song. So that's kind of Was this your only dream sequence in the series? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. And uh, really sure. whose arm is that? They're pulling you in. Uh, I don't remember. Who do you think? It was the prop guy or something. I mean, but, uh, but who, was that, who was that supposed to be? Just who was the arm? Uh, that I'm not sure. You know, this is, I think there's two things going on here. There's, you know, obviously the sausage is a phallic thing and he's saying you will eat our sausage. It's just, you will eat our sausage. It's very, you know, Freudian, I guess. Uh, but there's this other thing about, you know, him being uh, guilt ridden. You know, this thing's starting about, like, sin, and he's committed this evil. I think this this dream sequence was very much one of the things that inspired the episode that I would write in season two, where Christopher deals with heaven and hell and the afterlife and stuff like that. You know, that. I, I read somewhere, David, or I heard David in an interview saying, a lot of the dreams don't mean anything. Yeah, you know, but, like, you I know. Like they, dreams in itself. I mean, you know. Right, but that's that's true, but it's not true because when you are writing something like this and you're so invested in it, and your your ma your conscious is is so involved in it, your subconscious works as well. So there are no random choices. You might think it's random, but because your your you know your brain is working so heavily on this material, whatever comes up, sometimes you know for the most part reflects it. You know, not not just sometimes, but well, I think I everything's valid. I have some crazy uh, streams all the time. And well, that I makes a lot of sense. And, and I remember them, and I'll tell you what's even crazier. I'll get up, I take a piss because I piss four times a night because I'm an old man, and I'll get up, I'll piss, and I'll go back to bed, and the dream will continue where it was before I got up. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's, that's insane. All right, so we're at the banquet hall. Uh, they're having a wedding. Uh, Christopher arrives. He gives a gift. It's Larry Boy's daughter, Larry Boy Barese, played, played by Tony by Darrow. Tony right? Darrow, Livia, of course, uh, always nasty. Uh, did you bring one of your girlfriends or bring your wife? Whatever she said, she makes reference as always. He's trying to charm her, Larry Boy, and it's not working on Livia, uh, obviously. Also, in this scene, you see. Uh, he tells Tony he heard something's going down, but he gets distracted. And then you also see uh, Vinny Vella is an extra. Vinny Vella winds up being a character in season five. Jimmy, Jimmy Patrillo. Patrillo. And Vinny was a, they called him the mayor of uh, Little Italy. He lived yeah. on Elizabeth Street. He was a good guy, a lot of fun. A lot of he land. was in Casino. He had a kind of a big part in Casino. Big he was part. in Ghost Dog. He was in Coffee and Cigarettes. He was friends with Jim Jarmusch because Jarmusch lives in the same neighborhood. And he was and a good Jim guy. Jim put him in a few movies. You know, a fun guy. guy. A fun guy. Just And he passed away in the last year or so and uh, yeah. another guy gone, but a good guy. But in this one, they go to him twice. So David must have liked his, liked his look. He doesn't pop up yeah. in season five, but they, they give two close up, you know, two good shots of uh, of Vinnie Vella. Uh, and then when uh, Paulie's talking to Larry about the possible indictments coming down, you know, the song that's playing in the background is Wind Beneath My Wings. And I said wind is a reference here, but also wings, because yeah. uh, Altieri says to me, when did you get your wings? And Tony's hair, there's a lot of the wing to the wings. The wing well, we as we went True. through. Uh, so uh, he tells Paulie uh, about the, uh, the indictments, and like we said, the wings were bigger here, you know, way bigger than when we started. And we'll continue with the wing meter for those of you that like it out there. And we'll check in again in a few episodes, see how the wings are doing. Uh, Christopher, <laughs> uh, Jimmy O'Terry comes up to him and, you know, Chris is trying to fake it like he's, you know, one of the guys. He's not getting no respect. And this is well, he is one of the guys. He's just not a made guy, but he's doing, you but know, he's, he's, he's in the business. The, he's the, yeah, of course he's in the business, yeah. but he's the bottom guy. 
You know, right. he's still uh, doing the shit work, and he thinks he deserves more. And he's getting haunted by Emil. He killed him. That was a big deal. He's not moving up. This is. But not only does he think he deserves more, he want. It's not so much even about that as it as it is about being recognized for it. Yes. He says, you know, oh, they're going to want me. I'm OC. I'm organized crime. And he's saying, what do you mean? When did you? You know, it's like when did you get your wings? But so he's he's not even he's not even afraid of the indictments. He's no. more concerned with whether they're going to lump him in with everybody or not, which is where he wants to be. You know, uh, so uh, they're, uh, you know, so they get together. Now they know the indictment's out. It's coming down. They have, a, you know, all the captains are there with Junior. And uh, Junior says, as far as I'm concerned, it's speculation. And Ray Curdo, who they're not, they don't have that much confidence in Junior. Tony, what do you think? And Junior, of course, is what are you asking him for? I just gave you the answer because Junior is the boss. In- but what's interesting here is they're saying they want to shut it down. They want to shut business down because of the, you know, the murmurings about the indictments. Junior and Mikey Palmici don't want to shut it down, shut business down because they think it's rumors. It, would, it reminded me a lot of the debate over you know, what happened in America with coronavirus and the politics yeah, over it. Shut course. it down or not, it's only rumors. We got to shut it down for our own safety. But, but Curto, Just reminded me of that. Yeah, but Curto says, uh, you know, better safe than sorry. No, you know, the guys are scared. Better safe than sorry. Somewhere along the line, they say New York, half of New York's already gone to Fort Lauderdale. So uh, right. it's very much so. So uh, a pussy, uh, big pussy Vinny Pastor says, if I would have known, uh, I wouldn't have gave a $1,000 our boost. Now, for those of you out there that don't know what our boost is, it's an Italian thing meaning envelope, booster. It's, it's an envelope. Uh, most Italian affairs, they give a cash gift. They don't, you know, they give you our boost. And that's a lot of times that is what the bride and groom are going to pay for the wedding with. Sometimes not even in a car, just in an envelope. Just they give it an envelope, envelope, boom, and this is what they give. And there's two ways to do it. Sometimes there's a box. They call it a boost box. You drop the envelope in with a slit. Sometimes the bride goes table to table with a bag, fancy a bag. purse, fancy purse. Yeah. And, and uh, also, uh, many a person, with I kind of uh, am a bit of an expert on the uh, boost, uh, I wrote about it in my book. Uh, many a person won't, if they, especially if they're given a check or cash, they won't. They'll go to the wedding first. They'll see what the food's like, what the wedding hall's like, what the band is like, DJ, and then they decide how big our boost they're going to give. They see they already, what what they paid for for the wedding. How much they spent? So somebody might have it. I might have an intention to give them five hundred dollars or $1,000 a couple, and then they get there, they might take 300 out. So that's our boost, just so you know. Right. Big Pussy says, if I knew we were going to lamb it, I wouldn't have... <laughs> I, but now, I, lambing it is a good question. Uh, now, I always heard that the reason why wise guys don't have mustaches or beards is because when, if they do have to go on the lamb, they could grow a mustache or beard, and people don't have photographs of them. Ah, I didn't know that. So they won't recognize them. If you notice, nobody has mustaches on The Sopranos. Yeah, but what about the old days when they would call wise guys, he's a mustache? That's a, that's an old days. I'm talking about, the, you know, that they didn't have to lamb it back then. Very interesting. Uh, very, that's a later very thing. So uh, everyone's leaving the wedding. Uh, Silvio has a different wife. Yep. And then wasn't you see Maureen Van Zant yet. Gabriel, you see Gabriel. later on, Big Pussy has a different wife also. And what's playing here is Summer Wind. Wind, again, ref, another reference to wind. As, and as the, they're leaving, Summer Wind is playing. And the bride is in tears. Everyone's leaving. Everyone's scrambling. They're in a hurry. I mean, they are grabbing their wives and they're out of there. You know? And it's, it's pretty – it's funny and it's sad, it's sad for the bride. I mean, Big Pussy takes his boost back. I mean, yeah. you know, it's just, just ridiculous. Just absolutely ridiculous. Next, we're at the Soprano house, and, and they, they go up into the attic, and they're grabbing the money and the guns. 
the stash. Uh, Carmelo looks very comfortable handling those guns, I have to say. Absolutely. She's, She's all in here. She goes right into, you know, disaster mode very easily. And She's good. she and she goes, uh, she goes, all right, so here we go. Like kind of a, she knew at some point this was gonna happen. You know? uh, it's probably happened before, you know, and she's, she, she starts to cry and here, you know, it's difficult, you know, she knows what she's got to do, but it's hard. And they bring up the engagement ring, you know, uh, now, let me ask you about the engagement ring. Uh, from the look on Tony's face, he, he says, give me the jewelry. She's a little reluctant. Uh, he says, do you want them? We can't, we can't produce receipts. Do you want the FBI to steal it from us? <laughs> steal right. the jewelry that was stolen. Stolen, or probably he got it from a guy who owed him money, a gambler, who knows. And Very the engagement subtle. ring, probably the same way, but he denies that. Says, well, what do you think I'm him? at? It's a what great do you think look. I am? You know? A great look on his face. Great look there yeah. on, on Tony Soprano's face uh, uh, when he says, what do you think I am? You know. And uh, the kids are worried about their computers. Meadow says to AJ, you know, you got to delete the porn on your computer because the feds might be coming and confiscating it. And then we see Pussy at his house. There's helicopters. Reminds me of Goodfellas, you know, towards the end when he's here in helicopters and Pussy's kind of hiding his stuff. Back to the episode. Christopher is trying to write his screenplay. So uh, next we move on to Christopher's apartment, correct? Uh, Christopher's writing. Writing a script. He can't spell. It's not a good speller, Christopher. He calls Adriana for help with the computer. Sounds like me. I got to call my daughter every three minutes. Uh, Adriana wants to help. She says, I can't. Every sentence, you know, it's got to flow. She's making some sense of this, you know. Uh, but what I what I love about this is, and what I admire about Christopher, one of the one of the qualities I always liked is that he's doing the work. He's yeah. trying. He's sitting his ass in the chair. He's got his computer, and he's writing. He's not one of these guys who's saying, "I got a great story. If only uh, you know somebody should write my story." You know, he's sitting down and he's got a you know software program, a screenwriting uh, program, and he's, you know, trying to do it. And he's talking about his cousin Gregory's girlfriend, Amy, who D-Girl is an episode in the future that we go to where she appears. And he says she works for uh, Quentin Tarantino and that she really thinks I have potential to be, you know, to tell my story. I actually auditioned for Reservoir Dogs. Oh, really? Tarantino, just a Tarantino yeah. aside here. Uh, what role? When they were what casting role? it, uh, Chris Penn's role, nice guy Eddie Cabot, um, and uh, before I the got there, way before, yes. way before. I got the audition because I was working in Scorsese's office at the time for his development person, Melanie Friesen, and she got me the audition. And uh, Harvey Keitel was reading with everybody. He was at the audition. Quentin was there. Buscemi was there, and I knew Steve already, and he was in the hallway waiting. I think it was Todd Thaler was casting it. And I remember, you know, reading, they taped me. I think it came, I came pretty close to getting there, uh, apparently. At least wow. that's what they told me. And then the next year I was at Sundance when that movie uh, premiered at Sundance, and I saw it, you know, one of the early screenings of Reservoir Dogs and was pretty blown away by it. And what's funny is uh, later on, you star with Harvey in uh, Life on Mars on ABC, right after Life the Life on Mars. Yeah, and I worked with him on Clockers, too. I had a it's scene with him. In it's funny how things go around, right? Yeah. So, uh, so they're all watching. The TV report comes on. Uh, they're talking to the, the, the expert on uh, the Christopher's Mars. riveted when the guy starts talking. Christopher's like watching like he's entranced by this stuff, you know? He's waiting to hear his name. They mentioned Brendan. He's like, what, Brendan? They called him an associate, a soldier. Christopher's like, you know, he's not scared. That, that's the funny thing is he doesn't care that he might be arrested, you know, tomorrow. He's just worried about who's getting the credit for what, you know? And they're calling his, his friend a gangster, and he feels that he's the gangster and he should be the guy. I mean, what also is important here is that this Jeffrey Wernick, the guy who they're interviewing, mentions that sources tell him blah, blah, blah. So it's the inklings that there's a rat in the Soprano family. And 
you know, uh, Chris is pissed off, especially when they mention Brendan. You see, you also see Melfi is watching the interview. Uh, the indictment's coming down. Carmela and Tony are watching it. It seems like all of New Jersey is watching this. Of course, later on, you see uh, uh, Melfi's mom was watching it. So everyone knows these indictments are coming down, the Jersey mob. Christopher, you know, I knew a guy in Vegas. There was a, a, a reporter named Ned Day for the Review Journal. And he would write about the Chicago mob, which was running Vegas at the time in the early 80s. And every day they were in the paper. And I knew a couple of guys. They loved it when he put the name in the paper. Just loved it. Hey, did you read the paper this morning? You know, if you we ran into, see this guy, I don't want to get off my back. But they love the attention. They love knowing, they want everyone to know. They say they don't. They want everyone to know they're wise guys, they're mob guys. They love it. And that's what Christopher was looking for. That would It's power. Yeah, it's power. People fear you and it's recognition and it's celebrity to some extent as well. Now we get to, to, to Melfi's uh, house and uh, she's there with her son, her mom and dad and her ex-husband played by Richard uh, Romulus, who was in Mean Streets. He was he one of the He played Michael. He had, a very, he had a big part in uh, Mean Streets. He, wind up he was doing, in uh, Rockford Files, too. That's, I think, where David met him. He, met th- he did three Soprano episodes. Uh, hasn't worked a whole lot since. I don't know if it's by choice. He or- left. He moved to uh, an island, a Greek, one of the Greek islands, and is writing books now. Really? Yeah, Skiathos is the name of the island where he lives. I remember his wife. He was a very nice guy. I remember meeting him on the set. I didn't work with him, but I remember meeting him in the latest seasons. So they're talking about Italians. Uh, He says, hey, Grandma, this Ginzo sauce. I mean, the father and the son are absolutely, and Melfi, I guess they're Wonder Bread Wops, as we say. They are Wonder Bread Wops. They're not neighborhood people. They grew up with money. They're a little higher echelon than... They're not Goombas. They're not Goombas by (laughs) any sense of the word. They're legit people, which is fine. I'm just saying, grew up much different than people in my neighborhood. All right. right, For more more detailed explanation of what makes a Goomba, you should buy Steve's book, The Goomba's Guide to Life, because it goes into this argument in, in... exhaustive detail absolutely right? what's a goomba absolutely. what's not what does a goomba do what he doesn't do you know you're a goomba if all that if, kind you know, of stuff you'll find in his book if you if you have more pinky rings than pinkies something yes. you never hear a goomba say nathan lane i adore nathan lane so he since, was pissed uh, off at you for saying that he got right? mad at me yeah but we became but, friends later we worked together friends. but he pulled me up on that he pulled me up at a party. I was, uh, uh, he got me a little uh, uh, perplexed. He confronted you. Said, yeah. Absolutely. He's, he's he a kept, good dude. Great actor. He said, why the fuck are you, leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> uh, why don't you bother uh, Harvey Feierstein? What do you bother me for? And then I did Guys and Dolls with him at Carnegie Hall, and it was one of the best things I ever did. Uh, and he is a terrific guy. He could get a laugh. 2,000 people just by giving you a look. He's one of the greatest stage guys of all time. Uh, well, the family here is, is bring you know, they, they address this argument that we had to address on the show many times. You know, the image of Italians, does, does the mob move? Because they bring up The Godfather and Goodfellas and the mob, you know, movies besmirching the image of Italian Americans. And that's something we ha- we faced, especially in the early, you know, years of the show. There was some... Italian American groups, and we spoke about it uh, before. But um, you know, there was. A, are we promoting negative stereotypes? I mean, the reality for me is most Italian Americans that I've come in contact with, they love The Sopranos. The show is very beloved in their, you know, in their culture. Basically, I think. I think it's something that people. I think so. Also, I also for think, the most part. I, I also think. Uh, it's a story that needed to be told. Let's not kid ourselves here. You know, this this life exists, and it's a slice of uh, Italian-American life. I, I'm not every – If you're ignorant if you think every Italian is a mob guy. You're ignorant if you think every black guy is a rapper, you know, and so on. Every Jewish guy is cheap, you know. 
on and on and on, all the stereotypes. Right, there's stereotypes. Uh, I mean, he, he does say uh, there's only 5,000 mob members and 20 million Italian-Americans in the United States, but that's all people think about. Uh, it's the five th- of the mob, and of course pizza. Uh, the 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 son uh, annoys me a little. He's a, a cocky glib. I don't know why. Really, I didn't get that from him. Yeah, I get. That. I think he's kind of cool with uh, the you know the 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 image of the gangster. It's a father who's saying, you know, the father takes it to another level, saying, you know, you're working with a sociopath. You're working with you know, a, you know, a guy who's and he doesn't even know who he is. Criminal, who's scum, who you shouldn't even be you know, analyzing and, you know, who you shouldn't be have as a client or as a patient, which is a very hardcore uh, stance that the ex-husband's taking here. You know, he, he, he makes the thing, oh, okay, I get it. Another Italian with mother issues. Uh, that's what he says, uh, you know, about, and he doesn't know it's Tony Soprano, but he's been, he's obviously a psychiatrist himself and he, he knows the deal. I mean, he is an arrogant, self-righteous. He needs a fucking backhand, uh, this character, in my opinion. But uh, he brings up Joe Colombo and uh, the Italian-American Civil Rights League. That's what it was called. And in, it started in my neighborhood. Joe Colombo's from where I'm from. He in was a, ga- a, a gangster in the Profaci family, right? He, he was, yeah. And then he became the head of the Colombo crime the family. The Colombo family. And right. he started this. His sons, uh, one of his sons got arrested, and uh, he claimed they were hassling Italian Americans. And they got a lot done. Uh, the, the Godfather, they took the, the, the word mafia out, uh, commercials, Alka Seltzer, all Italian stereotypes. They got a lot done. This, the, the 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 irony was that this guy was the head of a mob family. Well, the the Godfather was having problems uh, shooting in New York because a lot of Italian Americans did not like the idea of them making a movie about the mafia. So Al Ruddy, the producer of the Godfather, sat down with with uh, Joe Colombo, and they made a deal. And Joe Colombo said, "Take out the word mafia and take out the word uh, La Costa Nostra, and uh, we'll be okay." And he helped them get the movie made. Well, that's where all this started, this Italian-American right. uh, you know, civil rights thing. And they got a lot done. And they had some big, uh, legitimate uh, Italian-Americans talk at their rally. And they had uh, uh, 5,000 people at then the Felt Forum at the Garden. Sinatra sang, County Francis sang, and so on and so on. I think Jerry Vale, uh, they raised money uh, for the group. Now, I was 12. I think I was 12 years old, and it was a few blocks away with the headquarters. And I remember, uh, I think it was, that's when it started, 1970. So it was the following year, I was 13. Uh, they had the rally in Columbus Circle, and that's when Joe Colombo was shot uh, by an African-American man. Uh, and it was, I think, the doing of uh, Crazy Joe Gallo. At the he was time. not killed, though. He didn't. He was die. not killed. He was uh, seven years. He was in a coma, and uh, there was all those seven jokes. years. He was seven in a years coma in a for coma. Seven years. Oh yeah, and there was a lot of uh, Italian jokes there. What's the newest kind of Italian vegetable? Joe Colombo. I remember that for some reason. Did he come out of the coma? He no. He, he died. died. He died. Uh, There's actually a really good book uh, that came out last year called uh, Colombo: The Unsolved Murder by. Uh, I think it's Joe Colombo's oldest son, Anthony Colombo, and a good friend of mine, Don Capria, who's a uh, filmmaker. And it uh, just came out last year. So if you guys want yeah. more info, check it out. Tony calls Christopher. He says, get down here. We're exterminating, which, uh, uh, you know, means we're looking for bugs. The FBI- Christopher's working hard. He's at hard at work, though. He's writing that script. He's not a good speller. Christopher can't spell for shit. Uh, a lot of people are bad spellers. Yeah. yeah. That was just- probably before spell check. Okay, there you go. Uh, Christopher's not happy. He's busy doing his writing a script. And Tony says, come down here. We need you and pick up some Schwoyadels, which is a, a great Italian pastry and ganolis. But it's funny that we're sweeping for bugs. This is a very important thing. It's come down right away, but make sure you bring the cannoli and Schwoyadels. Hey, listen, Italians, Priorities. Have, Italians eat at any time. They eat when it's good news, bad news, weddings, funerals. It's all, when do we eat? When do we eat? When should we eat? Where do we eat? 
it's amazing. That's that's what they do. Yes, sir. So he uh, stops off to the bakery, and he he has to take a number, and he takes number thirty four, which is the number that's in the dream. So the dream's coming true to some extent here. And that, like we spoke in the dream, it was about his manhood, challenging his manhood, finding it. Well, here's an instance where it's, uh, he takes that challenge or he makes it into a challenge in this scene. You know, the guy wants, he's waiting online, waiting online. And then a guy that the counter, uh, the counter boy knows walks in and he lets him jump in front of Christopher. That guy's played by Joe Ganascoli, who later we'll see his veto. Oh, yeah. And he was one of the few, uh, there was three characters, I think, uh, Pat, we talked about it, Philly and Patsy Parisi played two characters. They played twin brothers. And Cusimano, Jeannie Cusimano, and I think it was Jane Cusimano. She played, played by Sandra Santiago. Yeah. And also the counter guy that Christopher shoots is Brian Garrity, who's gone on to a big career. I mean, he was in Hurt Locker. He's been in all kinds of stuff. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It was. I think it was the second thing he did. Uh, just let me check this for a second. Brian Garrett. He was in the uh, uh, the, the the. He's had Chicago PD. He was a series regular for a few seasons. He's now filming the new The Fugitive. Okay. Uh, he's a series regular. He he turned out to have a big career. And now, obviously when Christopher shoots him in the foot because he's totally disrespecting him, totally, on every level. Uh, and uh, that's a la Spider, correct? Well, it's a, it's a reference and a wink and a nod that David put into the, my character in Goodfellas. You know, it's kind of like getting revenge, coming full circle and all that. But it's, uh, you know, Christopher asks him, do I look like a pussy to you? You know, so he's questioning his manhood. Maybe I, maybe I seem like I am, you know, less than a man or something like that. He's, you know, it's a legitimate uh, question, I think. It's not, just a jo it's not just a threat or a joke. You know, it's something that he's really mulling over here. And then he gets very like, all right, fill that box with, you know, it's not like he's robbing the guy. Give me the money. Fill the box with cannolis, Fliadel and Napoleon. It's, a, you know, he's so intense and serious about this what makes it very uh it's a great scene it's a great great it's funny but you know once again you shoot a guy in the foot and for some reason it's funny uh another yeah. thing is uh, christopher so so far uh, in the episode right uh christopher is not feeling good they didn't mention his name in the indictment on tv yeah uh, they mentioned he, his friend's name and made him out to be like a big, like John Gotti, like he says. They made Brendan look like John Gotti on TV. Okay, he's also uh, having a hard time with the script. Right. He's trying that. He's having a real hard time. Then uh, Tony calls him up like a gopher boy, pick up Shvuya Dell. Uh, he's got to do that. He's in the middle of the script. Now he comes there. And this fucking minimum wage counter boy is giving you a hard time. He's having a really bad few days right. so far. So he was justified in shooting the kid, right? I, 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 I kind of think so. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I think so. Yeah. Uh, if okay. only we could all do that. Right? <laughs> uh, so, and, and we've all been disrespected in the store. Of course. Of you know, course. uh, all the time, you know, so, so like even as us, I remember we went out somewhere, uh, we were somewhere and the bartender must have been an angry actor and he's mad at us for working. So he gave us shitty drinks, I think one time, like short shots. It's like, so either a guy likes you, wow, these guys, I'm a fan of the Sopranos, he gives you a free drink or he pours you a good pour or the guy goes, fuck these guys, fuck these two guineas. I'm going to fuck them. You know what I mean? And you get that too. You get both ends. It's not all fun and games, my friends. No, it's not. Not everybody's a fan. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, we haven't shot anybody yet. <laughs> so, oh, God. <laughs> Christopher <laughs> arrives. He's late. Sitting. He's late. It's one of the many late arrivals Christopher uh, commits over the course of this series. You he's get, very tired. You know, he's late. I'm sorry, T. He's late more often than he's not. Right. So, so uh, 
they, uh, you know, so he, he drops the four Yadels off. Uh, Tony calls him on being late. Paulie, for some reason, is in a hurry. Watch this for Yadels because you slam him on the table. But Tony sees that he's upset, and Tony's very kind to him here. Yeah. He takes him aside. He puts his arm around. You know, it's like very fatherly, very – he's not, you know, he's understanding and, and a bit concerned. It's, it's kind of a nice little beat there. You know, and he, like says, he says to Georgie – he says, go help Georgie look for bugs. Now, Georgie, played by Frank Cinerelli, who's a stand-up comic, his character is, is dumb. Is Not the awesome. brightest bulb. But he plays it great. It's very funny. He is this yeah. big guy and not that bright, and he, he, he really does a good job with this. And they're in the bathroom, and once again, uh, Brendan's name comes up that it was on the indictment, and Christopher says, Tony wouldn't even know him if it wasn't for me. Right. He says, I brought him around. Now they're making him look like this big gangster who got killed. Yeah, but Georgie says, I had no idea you brought him around. But the thing is, the guy's dead. (laughs) I know. He's dead. Christopher is upset because he's not getting a mention, but Brandon Falone is dead. He's jealous of this dead guy. Yes. Exactly. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's so uh, hilarious. It's it's uh, ridiculous. So uh, the retirement home. Uh, it's obviously- Libby is reading the obituaries, and one of Again. them says, uh, Foster Mother Supreme. <laughs> I don't know if that's intentional, but it is pretty interesting. Uh, that's the second time we see her in these eight episodes yeah. reading the obituary. Uh, so right away, Carmela says, I'm here to take you to brunch. And... Uh, she, uh, well, obviously, she knows something's wrong. She knows. And Carmela's lying. And oh, she wants a setup. It. This is a setup. Carmela's all in, like you said. Very good. And she wants to get her out of there, and she says, of course, hurtful things. Is he cheating on you again? And blah, blah, blah. And Meadow eats like a bird. Now, she calls her ma a lot. Do you call your mother-in-law ma? No. No, but my father called my grandmother, my mother's mother. Same here. Same here. That was an older thing. I don't know if uh, people today call. Like, I loved my in-laws both very much. I got along with them actually better than I did my own parents. And I called them Jim, and I called my mother-in-law Wilma, even though her name was Jane. Uh, but in the old days, everybody called, hey, Ma, hey, Ma, hey, Dad. Was it, was it because they got married younger? My dad got married very young. Maybe it's because of that. I don't know. I don't know, but you don't see that that often. You know, it still happens, but not that often. I don't know. Is it just Italians that do that? No, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, Let us know, fans and uh, listeners and viewers. Let us know. Do you call uh, your mother-in-law's ma? Yeah, please. Send us Uh, your comments about that. (laughs) So The song that's playing. Now, when Tony comes in, to, when they get Livia out of the house, Tony comes in to hide his stash of guns and money and stuff. The song that's playing is Welcome Back by Land of, of, uh, Land of the Loops, which is the first song playing in the pilot. So what do you think that means? Anything? I don't know. Just, we got to just, Dave. just I'm making write, a note about it. I'm going to write all these questions down, because when we get David Chase on the show, uh, yeah. I am... Uh, going to ask him all these things and he he, he loved the podcast uh, i spoke to him the other day and he said he was coming on he's happy yeah to come he will and be fine. so so let me ask you do you think he hides the guns in the in, in livia's hat box in this nursing home the guns and the money is that the best spot i mean i don't know i mean he can't go to any friends because all his friends are wise guys he can't go to the pork store. He can't go on his boat. He can't go to the Bada Bing because those places are gonna, the first places that are going to be, you know, raided probably besides yeah. his house. So he's taking a shot. Yeah, for sure. Back to Melfi's office. Uh, he tells Melfi he may go on vacation. And she says, you, you may go on vacation. You have no, no idea when. <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense, does it? It's, yeah. it's, it's so fantastic, you know. Uh, okay, Christopher's apartment. Paulie comes by. This is he, one of my favorite scenes. Uh, you it's know, a great scene. Really, and, and it's the first great scene that I had with Tony uh, of, of many, you know, and, and a really important scene to establish the relationship between Paulie and Christopher, I think, you know. Um, it's well written. 
Tony's great in it. It's the mood. It's dark in there. Adriana's gone. The place is a mess. Christopher's trying to write. He's feeling dissed by the, the media. He's feeling dissed by Tony. He's, you know, he's having an identity crisis, really. Well, he says, I've only written 19 pages, which I think is not bad. It's pretty no, admirable. I thought so, too. He said, I, I bought a, a program, a, a computer program for writing so, screenwriting, and I thought that would do a lot of the work, <laughs> <laughs> which is funny. Um, you know, and, and uh, Paulie brings up that, hey, the, the cops... Uh, you know, have word that, you know, a guy with a Lexus shot this kid in a pastry store. Christopher's oblivious to the danger. He's oblivious to the possibility that he might get, you know, arrested. He doesn't really care. He's really worried about this recognition. And, you know, Paulie brings up Hemingway, who committed suicide, and, uh, you know, which I find very bizarre. Uh, you know, the room is dark. He says, come on, I got two broads outside. Uh, the place is a pigsty because it's a mess. You see, you see four cans of empty cans of beer. Uh, so Christopher's there. I don't know if he, he's not really drunk. He's just kind of melancholy. Uh, Paulie says he's content when when Christopher tells him, you know, uh, life is. Uh, you know, where's my ark? Where's my ark in life? And uh, you know, you wait for something to happen, and, and you know, Paulie says, well, nothing happened, and he's very content. Right. In the life he leaves and and lives, and he says, uh, "I went to the military, and I also, uh, you know, then I went to the can for a while, and now I'm a half a wise guy, not unlike Tony Sirico himself. He was right. in the military, and he told me an incredible story uh, when he was in the military, and uh, he was in, I think, could he be in Korea? Maybe I don't Korean. Maybe more. that makes sense. Yeah." yeah. And I never knew that about him. And one night we were out, uh, uh, we had dinner with a few people, and, and it was, as always, his stories make me laugh. I said, maybe there's a Korean guy somewhere with wings, a little Korean kid. And he had around. a little baby. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, you know, I, he also says, we'll get our joints copped, you know, which refers to oral sex. Uh, you know, blowjob, but uh, and the words will come blowing out your ass. <laughs> I don't know how he figured that out, but uh, I, I find that funny. But what what I think is really important in the scene, Christopher says, you know, I don't want to just survive. Yeah, I want more out of life, which really I think is definitely related to his problems with addiction later, which is a lot of why people turn to drugs because. You know, life is just not enough. They want to escape it. They want more. They, you know, it's, you know, ordinary life is just not enough for them. And they're looking for something bigger and looking to get out of that. And I think this is like the seeds of that or the beginning, you know, the beginning of the psychology of addiction. You know, what got me in the scene is Paulie legitimately wants to know. He sits down. It's not like, come on, I don't want to hear this bullshit. Oh, no. Out yeah. of here. He's interested. He sits down. He has a talk to. And then one time he tells him, you know, uh, you shot the kid's toe off, which is a whole lot different than uh, just shooting a guy in the foot. And, you know, you left fingerprints everywhere. Obviously, uh, the, the, the Joe Ganescoli character can identify you. Sure. So, you know, it's amazing. The Lexus outside, I mean – you know yeah paulie's very you know uh, compassionate here and understanding and it, uh, i really love this scene between the two of them i think it's really important and uh, it was really i remember having a lot of fun playing this one it's great that was a good scene and then yeah. uh, of course uh he, he goes uh, christopher goes to see big pussy and uh he tells him i have no identity pussy says that uh the more kills you get the easier it'll be to sleep because Christopher's talking about his dreams, his nightmares. And uh, then he says, I think Emil Kolar is trying to give me a message from beyond the grave. And, and Pussy says, why would he give you a message? You put a moonroof in his head, which is really good logic, actually. If you think about it, I think it's good food, for, food for thought for Christopher. I mean, but Christopher's uh, getting paranoid. So he wants to dig up the body. He's afraid that, uh, you know, this body's going to get him in trouble for some reason. 
and uh, him and Georgie go down to the Meadowlands in the swamps and dig up the body. Christopher's not afraid of the the body. He's not even grossed out about it. Right, but you're doing it in the middle of the daytime. I mean, it's just like the two of you in the middle of the day. It's a very funny scene. You see the guy grew a beard, and I guess he that says, happened. "Is that he?" Uh, Georgie says, "Is that him?" <laughs> says, that's a, be a pretty pretty big coincidence if it wasn't. <laughs> and then he says, "Look, he grew a beard, and and uh, his nails are like a woman." And, uh, and and Georgie says, "I read about that, and it's pretty pretty creepy." It's pretty, you know, pretty creepy. creepy. And then Georgie goes and pukes. Very, very funny yeah. scene. And then they bring up the Pine Barrens. They're going to have to take the body and bury it down the Pine Barren, which is much further away than the Meadowlands, than to where they, to where they live and operate. First time we hear about the Pine Barrens. First time we hear about the Pine Barrens, yeah. Uh, so Melfi and her ex uh, are looking at the piece of property that they own. Uh, and, you know, he says, I could use an influx of money if we're going to help Jason, which is not an Italian name, is it, Jason? No, but that's, I think that's the point. Yeah. You know. So if we're going to help Jason, you know, after he graduates, we're going to help him, you know, set up an apartment and stuff, obviously. And she says, that's fine, but I, I always thought, you know, we would, it wasn't an investment property. We would have our life here. Obviously, that's changed. And it's. As long as you don't bring one of your Colleen's on the cruise. And I had never yeah. heard that term. Uh, Colleen, oh, you know, you guys, you love the freckle face Irish girls. Yeah. I don't know. That's not uh, neither here nor there to me. Not, not. Well, years ago, a lot of Italians married really? Irish. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Absolutely. That was a, a real thing, for sure. And she goes, your Calabrese is showing, which is very funny. Uh, Calabrese are known for being hard-headed, stubborn. Very funny, very funny. My grandfather was Calabrese, yeah. And so am I. My grandfather on my mother's side, yeah. My, on my father's side is from Rome. Yeah. Well, what he brings up here, though, uh, uh, Melfi's ex, is interesting when she says, when you get beyond the moral relativism, you get to good and evil, and he's evil, meaning Tony Soprano. And that's kind of an argument throughout the course of the, uh, of the series, you know, it's like she's trying to treat this guy, this mobster, you know, and trying to, you know, deal with him on a moral and ethical level and a psychological level. And, but this guy, uh, uh, her ex-husband is basically saying he's evil. But she, he doesn't even know it's Tony. He just knows. No, he knows he's a gangster. He knows that guy. Yeah. So he's saying that, you know, whatever, whatever you're going to do with this guy, treat, you're not going to ever treat him because he's, and evil. He's chosen a life of evil. You're not going to cure him, basically. Which and is an she says you bow down to the argument. dignity. You, you, you know, you bow down to the dignity of Connie Francis. So, because uh, he hates all the Italian stereotypes and et cetera, et cetera. And he would hate this show, The Sopranos, for sure. He would hate The Sopranos, I bet. Yes. Uh, and then we have another scene, another one of my favorite scenes. And, and this, again, I think it really established. Uh, Christopher's relationship to Tony, uh, to Tony Soprano in this scene. It's a really important scene. Um, Tony's waiting for him. Christopher's late again. Christopher's license plate says OG on it, which I found interesting. It says OG 550C. I don't think it's a vanity plate, but it's the first two letters are OG, original gangster. Yeah, but it, it's not by accident. Like everything else is an accident. That didn't just I think just that's happen. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love this scene between... Uh, Tony and Christopher. I mean, he smacks him. He's late. Uh, Tony smacks Christopher. Christopher's late. I think he's being a father figure here. Uh, and Christopher talks about how he feels the regular regularness of life is too hard. Again, very kind of addict mentality. You know what I mean? And, and Christopher starts thinking he might have cancer. Yeah. Yeah. That Just was... because he can't sleep and he has. But I think what he's referring to metaphorically is the guilt the sin that's starting to infect his, you know, psyche and consciousness, and, you know, karma, the idea of karma, something coming back to him, you know, something that he did coming back. Well, well, he sees, he also sees, uh, he asked Christopher, obviously, uh, Tony seeing what Christopher's going through in his own stuff, right? He's depressed. He's assuming you're depressed. He asked if you ever, he asked Christopher, if you ever thought of killing yourself, Right, blowing your head off when he does that. 
And uh, he says, I'm no mental midget. Christopher says to him, I'm no mental. About depression. Yeah. About depression. Yeah. Are you depressed? Yeah. I'm no mental midget. And then you see the look on Tony's face. Right. Uh, and I, I guess Tony has considered suicide, it seems. Oh, yeah. Seems. For sure. Yeah. For sure. You know, you didn't know it until right now. Because that right. never came up. Uh, and then Tony also likes, uh, you know, he's he's Tony's uh, rattled here, you know, and having this conversation. And he said, well, Christopher says, Prozac, not for this skinny guinea. And then Tony tries to light a cigarette at the wrong end. Right. And then puts it out. It's a really, really good scene, and it's a heavy scene. You well, know? Tony's worried about, you know, the fact that Christopher shot this uh, – this kid in the foot, Mackayzian heard about it. Uh, the cops are looking for the shooter now. You know, uh, Tony Soprano didn't really smoke. Uh, and Jim didn't really smoke. So Tony, once in a while, he grabs for a cigarette. Once in a while, Jim, before certain scenes, would ask for lucky strikes. And yeah. Jim wasn't a smoker. There were certain scenes he'd ask for a pack of unfiltered luckies, and he'd smoke one. And he told me, and I asked him, Jim, about it one day. I said, what, what, what's with the Lucky Strikes? He goes, my father used to smoke. Yeah. Somehow that unfiltered Lucky would connect him to something uh, that he related to Tony Soprano or his father or something, and he would you know, use that to get into a scene sometimes. He used some other tricks, too. He told me about uh, uh, when he had to be mad and uncomfortable, he, he used to put rocks in his shoes pebbles in his shoes, you know, and it would hurt his feet, get him pissed off. Right. He told me little things like that. Also, you know, what's amazing at the time, and you see Adriana smokes. Uh, I smoked back then. I was a smoker. You a heavy I'm smoker. Not Tony was a smoker. Sylvia was a smoker. Uh, Tony Sirico was a smoker. Tony Sirico. Yeah. Artie uh, Bucco was a smoker. Uh, Edie was a smoker at the time. I don't oh, think I you ever. Them. I don't think you ever see around the Sopranos, but yeah, every like the whole cast smoked, yeah, you know, or, or a lot of them. Pretty much everybody quit. Yeah, that was a really good scene. That must have took a while to shoot, no? It's a great scene. Yeah, yeah, I had a really good time shooting that. It was those two scenes with the one with Paulie Wallace and one with Tony for for Christopher were really, you know, they 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 set a certain tone for their relationships, and and uh, I just remember loving diving into those with those guys. It was great. Uh, that was uh, good stuff. You've had some, you had some great stuff. You did an incredible job in this episode. Uh, Tony, so the, the Soprano house, the Freds arrive. Uh, we say, uh, we see Agent Harris played by Matt Servito. He winds up doing 24 episodes of the series. It's the first time we see him. Good guy, great actor who's been in everything. Yeah. And this guy works, and, works, works. And an interesting relationship. Develop, begins here between him and Tony because he does cut Tony a little break by going yeah. to the back door, not busting the door down, which they could have done. They could have busted the door down, made a lot of noise and racket. And he gives him a warning. He says, we're coming in. Your kids are here. Do what you got to do. An interesting aside regarding the feds, the cul-de-sac where the real Soprano house is, one of the houses on that cul-de-sac yeah. was a, uh, one of the Unabomber's first targets. He's, you know, Unabomber mailed mail bombs and to it really, executives it, for certain corporations. I forget who, what corporation this and guy he killed the guy? For. I don't think there was a murder. I'm not sure. But, but, but the, the bomb, bomb went off. Went off on the cul-de-sac there. Yeah. Jesus, what are the chances of that? Yeah, that's pretty weird, right? And, and uh, you know. So AJ Tony notices that this guy's cutting him a break. He's not going to. Be friendly, obviously. He's not going to be nice, but he does. You see him register. Okay, you know what does this mean? This guy's, you know, you they know, could've, he, they could have made life really bad in that. Well, moment. he says we don't want to try to traumatize the kids. You know, first thing he says is, "How'd you get in my backyard?" Uh, and later on, we'll see where. Way later on, uh, we see Agent Harris tipping him off. Uh, Remember, uh, there's a whole thing that right. goes down the end with the terrorists and 9-11 uh, and, and stuff. Okay, now, well, Tony doesn't show up to Melfi's, uh, to the appointment. Uh, right. She takes a look, and... Uh, the other Fed is an Italian guy who drops, who breaks a, a bowl, and Tony looks at him like he's an Italian Judas. He's betraying all Italians by being a Fed and, and trying to go after other Italians. So, so what Tony says uh, in Italian, 
I'll open up your ass, basically, right? Right. Very yeah, derogatory. Very, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> There's no I, nice way of saying it. This is a that. universal <laughs> sign for, for people you can't see this. Yeah, universal asshole. Yeah. Open up your asshole. Uh, so a uh, very derogatory saying, and, and the FBI kind of go, you know, half ass goes after him. You know, uh, oh yeah, you no, know, makes a move because it's a really nasty thing. Tony's whole family, the kids are seeing this. You know, uh, the whole family's in the kitchen. Uh, Tony tells them to pick it up. You know, uh, now they're at dinner. They're eating Chinese food. Obviously, and an interesting contrast between the Sopranos dinner here and Melfi's family and the things that they're taught there because they're talking about Italian Americans and the you know uh, they're talking about stereotypes in the Melfi family. Now they're talking about you know, Italians being persecuted and what the, the Italian Americans they should be proud of who discovered and, and that they've been ripped off. The Italian who, uh, Miucci who discovered the telephone got robbed because he was Italian. They gave credit to uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, how Sacco and Vanzetti got railroaded because, and persecuted because they were Italians. Uh, spaghetti, they try to say that spaghetti was invented by the Chinese, but, uh, you know, they don't want to give credit to that. To the Chinese, it makes you know. no sense. People that eat with sticks, uh, and it's Chinese food, obviously. But what went on? Uh, they had no. Carmela had no time to cook, so uh, they ordered Chinese food in. They have this big discussion, and uh, and Meadow challenges him. Oh, there. absolutely! Who invented the mafia? She has. She sees. She has seen everything going on. She knows. Right exactly what's happening here and she saw earlier which i didn't mention she watched them take the guns and the money out of the attic she saw that her mother right she absolutely knows. privy to what's going on there's no they're not fooling her anymore you know uh and then tony of course at the end brings up sinatra yeah. Right, and the song the song that was playing in uh, the scene with me and Paulie was not Sinatra, but it was Summer Wind. Uh, no, Summertime. Sorry, Summer Wind was playing in the... I'm confusing the wind and the summer. And, of course, he has... Uh, he brings up Francis Albert, which is the topper. End of story. We got Sinatra, that's that. Checkmate. We go to Melfi's office, and Tony doesn't want to pay for the missed appointment. He wants everybody to bend to his will, you know, because his his life is so special and he's so special. He thinks every because he's used to everybody, you know, adjusting to his thing. And he expects Melfi. I thought, you know, we had a, I thought we had an agreement. She's saying, no, agreement is you pay for missed appointments. And he's, you know, he's used to getting his way. He doesn't like the fact that she wants to get paid. Although he's always about money, money, money. And then he just throws the money. At I mean, he just goes off. He is livid. He's calling her like a call girl. He's yeah. throwing the money, cocksucker. I mean, fucking, I mean, he is as pissed. Uh, and you know what? Like, kind of, I, I think, but she had talked about it in a previous episode. You know, I tell you all the things, you know, she's as nice as can be, and she's soft-spoken, and she's, you know, he thinks when he tells her he loves her, she's the perfect woman. And once again, I mean... It's her job to be nice. It's her job. Right, but there, there has to be those boundaries. And they did agree if he misses an appointment, he's got to pay. She can't keep track of his. I, I'm not saying know, he's right here, but I could understand why he's pissed. Yeah, he's also used to getting it, you know, his own way. And he <laughs> he's is. Used to, he's used to dictating the terms. And, and she's he, do, she dictates the terms here. So and he is, like he is livid. Uh Next, Junior goes to see Livia at the retirement home. Uh, there's a, uh, they, they're in like the, uh, I guess, whatever room. There's a comic on stage. They're in the rec room. He's telling very uh, esoteric, you know, he's talking about a joke about the Polish version of Rashomon, which is a very, it's going to go over everybody's head pretty much. It's there's no very funny. And yeah. uh, his name is Ed Krasnick, and he used to work for me in Vegas. He used to work for me quite a bit. And he's a very smart, kind of nerdy guy. And uh, I called him last night, and I haven't talked to him in quite a long time. And I just, uh, after I watched the episode, I wanted to, I, first of all, I asked him, was that his material? Or did he write that? Or did David write it? And that was his material. Not, that, not material that he, 
uses when he works clubs, but he became friends with David years ago at CBS Radford. He was working on a show, Ed, as a writer, and David was, and they started talking and talking about music and, and TV shows. And Ed does an impression of Ed Sullivan, which you saw. He did, yeah. He does the, uh, an impression, and he said they became pretty good friends. They went out to dinner, et cetera, et cetera. And David was writing a show for CBS, and it was about two women uh, who were grifters, and they wind up in the witness protection program uh, in the Midwest and in a small town. And he, he told Ed that if the show went, he would have him play the town doctor as Ed Sullivan. Great idea. David's so, he said, so you know, creative you know, cough, out of the box. Cough, you know, uh, open up and say, ah. And Ed was doing it for me last night as Ed Sullivan. It's hilarious. hilarious. That's to great. Think about it. And so uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really funny. So uh, Livia tells, you know, and obviously they start to walk out because he's just bombing. And this, he's, he does two episodes that's classic. You see, we'll see him again in the second. In the Bada Bing, right? Yeah. And yeah. that and that material, Frank Renzulli, I believe, wrote that material. Yeah. But this one, Ed wrote himself. David just let him go. Uh, and uh, uh, Livia tells Junior that Tony is seeing a psychiatrist. And Junior's stunned. Well, to, to someone like Junior, you ba- basically you're saying he's insane because Junior doesn't look at it like, okay, you have some issues, you want to work out. You go to psychiatrist because you're nuts. In yeah. Junior's world. Well, Junior also come, he comes from a different era. Well, that's what I mean, though. But that's what he's thinking. People who go to psychiatrists, to Junior, to his generation, are crazy in his mind, right? It's not like us. We understand you have an issue, you work it out. He's thinking Tony's crazy. What does that mean? Yeah. Big, it's a big, big, big deal. And he tells her when he first gets there, there's a, it looks like we have a rotten apple or a bad apple. A rat. He realizes there's a rat, you know, because that's how the feds, that's how the feds knew that Junior's now the boss and that's how the feds know what's going on. There's a rat. And uh, uh, she said, you know, she's stirring the pot, man. She manipulates, she plays Junior very easily. And she says, I don't want any repercussions before this is over. Junior just can't believe it. I don't want any repercussions, which to me means... She does want repercussions. She does want repercussions, of course. That's what I'm getting from that, all right? Uh, Christopher gets a wake-up call from his mother. He's in bed, and his mother says, they mention your name in the newspaper with all those, you know, what did she say, scumbags or something? Scumbags. And, uh, and Christopher is very excited. Loves it. Now, let me, up until that point, he's depressed in bed. It's his only enjoyment, right? That's the only thing he enjoys. Sleep. He tells yeah. Paulie that. Uh, the voice, was that who played your your mother? The voice there was a woman named Lydia Lennett. And eventually, my mother would be portrayed by Marianne Leone, who uh, worked with us in Household Saints, the movie that I met Michael She's great. On. She was great. She's great. She's married to Chris Cooper. You know, one of the best actors around, and they're 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 two wonderful people. And Marianne, yeah. the the scenes I had with her, I I just so enjoyed. Uh, she's a she's a really good writer as well. She's a fantastic actress. I remember when Chris uh, came to they came to the parties and the finales yeah. and the premieres, and uh, I remember meeting him. He was a nice guy. Uh, Christopher's over the moon. Uh, now the next thing we see, Melfi. Family and therapy. Family therapy. The Wonder Bread Wop family goes to see therapy, of course. You know, what Italian family. I've, I haven't met one growing up that the, the whole family goes to therapy. No, but maybe they should. <laughs> maybe they should. A lot of them should have. Uh, yeah, played by the therapist is Sam Coppola playing a Jewish guy, but he was the, the guy who owned the paint store in Saturday Night Fever. Was he related? Is he related to Francis Ford? I don't know about that, but he's been in a lot of movies. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he yeah. was big, in big Fatal actor. Attraction. He was in Jacob's Ladder. Uh, really good actor. And they're talking about Patient X, who's Tony Soprano. They're talking about this, this you know, dilemma and this possible danger 
you know, that uh, Mel Jennifer Melfi might be in by, you know, having this guy as a patient. And, uh, you know, the, the therapist is kind of being dismissive about it. Yeah, yeah, he's very uh, glib, very glib. Glib. Absolutely. Glib. And then brings up the, you know, the fact that his, you know, he had a, a relative that, uh, you know, was involved in Murder, Inc., who, you know, was the driver for Louis Lepke. And he's kind of proud of that. Oh, absolutely. You know? He's, he's denigrating the sleeve. mob, but then he's kind of proud that he had these connections. Complete contradiction. Uh, also, Will McCormick, who plays uh, Jennifer Melfi's uh, son, he's gone on to, I mean, he, he continued to act, but he's a writer, he's an executive producer on Claws. I think that was a TNT or a TBS show. Also, uh, well, there's another big show. I mean, he became a writer, producer. He got into that world. A to Z. So, and then Anika Pergament, who did nine Soprano episodes, she's the anchor. She was she's an anchor. a real, she was a yeah. real anchor woman. for New yeah. York One. I think she still yeah. may be. I don't have New yeah. York One anymore, but she did nine episodes. She's very good. She was our go to anchor person. Yeah, she was very good. We go to the street, Christopher racing to get a newspaper, uh, sees his name. They mentioned Jason Minter as one of the guys that got arrested. Jason Minter was our locations guy who became David Chase's assistant. On the who we're going to talk to down the road. Who we're going to talk to. Yeah, down he was the also road. a location guy early on. Right. You know? right. And and Christopher puts in, uh, I guess it's a quarter, whatever it is. He gets the one paper and then he sees his name in there and then he puts another one in. He steals, you know, fifty newspapers or whatever. And it seems like all his dreams and fears are gone for the moment when he sees his name. All his problems have vanished when he sees his name in print in the well, paper. He seems, he's justified now. He got the stamp of approval. He's, he's a real gangster. He's one of the guys, man. I mean, that's... Uh, he's and happy. the song that's playing there is by Cake, and it's a song called Frank Sinatra, which, uh, you know, here... Somewhere it's a local boy made good. You know what I mean? Sinatra's a Jersey boy who, you know, became a celebrity, obviously. And Christopher kind of relating to that on some level, becoming a celebrity. It's a really good song. The lines, flies and spiders get along together. I don't know if that reflects to the scene earlier in the great, history uh, show. You, you were great. great. I'm, not, I'm not just saying it because you're here. But you're a, a great, great, great episode for you. But, uh, uh, we got to take our... Great, uh, great, great in that. Yeah, it was a good so, show. Uh, now, Spencer asks, the meal scenes in The Sopranos always give me a craving for Italian food. What kind of food were you guys eating during filming? Where did it come from? Was it good? Yeah, this is for you, this question. You didn't eat that much. Sure. I ate, sure. We all they did. had me eating all the time on the show, obviously. Uh and the scene where uh, the Quasimodo scene, where I, you know, I tell uh, me and Tony are in a diner, and I say Quasimodo predicted all this. I ate six ribeye steaks. I'm not kidding you. I wanted it to look real, and you know, once you get caught up, I couldn't get out of it. You know what I mean? I had to continue to eat it. So I ate six ribeyes. They were great. We were in a, a, a Greek diner in Jersey. Uh, also, another scene where I had to eat a lot in uh, later on is Robert Loja, Feech Lamana, uh, Uncle Junior, Tony, and Bobby. Bobby's doing the cooking, and he makes chicken cacciatore with rice. And, uh -huh. I, rem and I remember it's 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going, this is fantastic. I got the green light to eat fucking chicken cacciatore at 7 o'clock in the morning. And by 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I mean, I, I think I started clucking. That's how much chicken I ate. And Jim. You know, Jim was an eater. He ate, he ate the shit, too. So uh, they always had great food on the set. It, we made sure it was from a good Italian restaurant. The prop people were in charge of that. They didn't just whip it up in the back. This came from legit really good restaurants in Queens in the neighborhood. Uh, or if you were in that restaurant shooting, you know, uh, you would get the food from that restaurant. Also, uh, cater you know, catering and also just the craft service. Every day there was mozzarella, provolone, supersad. Every single day it was Italian stuff, uh, you know, on the set. So they fed us well. 
Yes, they did. Uh, uh, fed us well. And, uh, I Thank love you, those Spencer, things. for the question. Good job. Very good, Spencer. Enjoy your Bose uh, Headphone 700. You can learn more at Bose.com. All right, pal. Where are we at good now? One. Okay, so we will be dropping a new episode. This is what I want to tell the people, right? So we're dropping a new episode every Monday. Look for that, please. And thanks for listening. And remember to subscribe to the Talking Sopranos podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Producer is Andy Verderam. Uh, music, our theme song, which is called Long Way to Now, is composed and performed by Elijah Amiton. Check that out on SoundCloud. Our production crew includes Eric Desi, Bobby Hutch, Frank McKay, Ty Verderam, and Ciara Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. And thank you to Jamie Lynn Sigler. That was a wonderful yeah. interview. It was great seeing you. And, uh, See you next week. See you, brother. I'm out.